Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Wednesdays at the Center, hosted by the John Hope Franklin Center and the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies. Today, we are pleased to welcome Duke History Professor Calvin Chang Miao for a talk titled Solidarity, Third Worldism, and the Activist Origins of Asian American Studies. The Director of Asian American and Diaspora Studies at Duke, Professor Esther Lee, will introduce the speaker and will moderate the following Q&A. Please remember to keep your microphone muted. You may want to submit your questions and comments in the chat or raise your hand in the Zoom function. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rohini. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Calvin Ching Mao, who is Assistant Research Professor of History at Duke. He's a historian of race and works at the intersection of intellectual history and social movement history. His current book project, um, Asian Americans and the Color Line, uses the history of Asian American studies to explore the rise and fall of third, third worldism within the US. As some of you may know, Dr. Ching Mao was hired as part of a cluster hire in Asian American Studies last year. Um, students have been demanding more courses in Asian American Studies for over 20 years, and they're already connecting with Dr. Ching Mao, seeking his advice and mentorship. Next year, uh, next semester, he'll be teaching Introduction to Asian American History, which is a much needed course at Duke. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ching Mao, not only to this talk, but also to Duke. So welcome, uh, and I'll also be moderating the Q&A after the talk. So again, please uh, um, jot down or type in your questions in the chat box or raise your hand and I'll um, make, make sure that we have a very lively conversation. Thank you. Dr. Chung Mao. Thank you, Professor Lee, for the introduction. And I, of course, want to thank um, Haney and the John Hope Franklin Center for giving me the opportunity to talk with you all. Um, and also to thank uh, Yan Lee for suggesting that I do this in the, in the first place. All right, now let me just take a moment to share my screen. The idea of Asian America begins with activism. In the late 1960s, street youth in San Francisco's Chinatown ran a pool hall and then launched a militant organization modeled on the Black Panther Party. Middle-aged residents of Seattle's International District protested job discrimination in construction projects. Sansei in Los Angeles set up community programs to deal with drug abuse. Filipino farm workers launched a strike in Delano and an intergenerational multi-ethnic crew in New York protested the US-Japan Security Treaty. And then there were the students. Coming from multiracial hoods like Southeast Stockton or Japantown in the Fillmore in San Francisco, from housing projects and apartments in ethnic enclaves, from single family homes in predominantly white communities where their parents had gotten around res restrictive racial covenants, they entered college campuses in unprecedented numbers. Starting their higher education as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Filipino Americans, activism would add a new identity to the ones they had grown up with, Asian American. How and why did these students begin calling themselves Asian American? And why did they begin to demand Asian American studies? And what did they do after they won Asian American studies programs? Now, these are the questions we'll be thinking about today. It's kind of like an introduction to Asian American studies and Asian American identity. So we're going to first talk about the social and political context of the late 1960s, focusing on the emergence of third worldism, which was extraordinarily influential among Asian American activists. Then we're going to look more closely at the organizations at San Francisco State and uh, the third world liberation front strike that established the College of Ethnic Studies there. And finally, we'll take a brief look at what Asian American studies programs were like in the first years of their existence, focusing on University of California at Berkeley and the University of California at Davis. So this talk focuses mainly on students, um, mainly on the San Francisco Bay Area, mainly on 
East Asian and Filipino Americans, but there was of course activism in other sectors and other geographic regions, other groups that we could uh, definitely talk about in the Q&A. It's impossible to understand the intensity and the urgency of Asian American activism in the late 1960s without understanding what the decade of the 60s was like. It was a time of extreme volatility and high polarization, a decade of black insurgency and indeed global insurgency and a decade of violent counterinsurgency. In 1968, is when all of this seemed to crescendo. At the end of January 1968, the National Liberation Front in Vietnam launched the Tet Offensive. Simultaneous attacks by the NLF on 120 cities in South Vietnam, including 36 of 44 provincial capitals in the US Embassy in Saigon. In February, hundreds of black students protested a segregated bowling alley in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and police responded by shooting and killing three people and wounding 30 more. In March, 10,000 Mexican-American students in Los Angeles walked out of six different high schools. In the same month, the first building takeover on a college campus happens, not at Columbia, but at Howard University. That takeover lasts 102 hours. April. On April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated on a balcony in Memphis, and there are uprisings in 100 cities across the United States. In May, the government of France nearly collapses in the face of joint student and worker rebellion. In June, Robert Kennedy is assassinated. In August, the Democratic National Convention takes place in Chicago, and outside the convention, a police riot against the protesters occurs and is broadcast on national television. In October, the Mexican police opened fire on student protesters in the run-up to the Olympics, um, likely killing hundreds. The exact number has not been uh, de conclusively determined. November is when the San Francisco State College Third World Strike begins. So I invite you to imagine being a student during this time. Like many students today, you might have asked yourself what your education was for how what you were learning in the classroom related to what you were reading about every day in the news. You might have also asked yourself whether your education was relevant to the issues your community was experiencing. In 1968, Black unemployment in the San Francisco Bay Area was around 30% for Latinx uh, residents in the Mission neighborhood of San Francisco. Unemployment was around 20% with um, half of the community living below the poverty line. In San Francisco, Chinatown, unemployment was around 15%, but around 60% of the community lived below the poverty line. And here's how Ling Chi Wang, a Chinese American doctoral student at Berkeley, described San Francisco Chinatown in 1968, quote, Chinatown is unquestionably a ghetto in every sense of the word. Cultural and language barriers have prevented the overcrowded population from seeking employment outside of the confines of Chinatown. High unemployment and underemployment rates provide fertile ground for small time opportunist businessmen to exploit at will the helpless and the poor of their own race to the fullest extent. Substandard housing, tuberculosis, suicide, mental illness, and juvenile delinquency are widespread. Now, in calling Chinatown a ghetto, Wang was drawing a comparison between the conditions of Chinese Americans and African Americans. And through the early 1960s, the term ghetto uh, typically evoked Jewish and other immigrant ethnic enclaves, but that had changed with the publication in 1965 of Kenneth Clark's book, The Dark Ghetto. Clark claimed to find in urban African American communities a range of psychological ills, social disorganization, educational inequities, economic problems. And he claimed that these were all symptoms of racial uh, oppression and powerlessness. In the years following the publication of Clark's book, Chinese Americans like Ling Chi Wang and other activists believed they saw similar problems in the nation's Chinatowns. In 
we're conceptualizing the situation of Asian Americans generally and Chinese Americans specifically as one of racial oppression was a break with ideas about race relations that had been popular during the mid 20th century. During that period, social scientists believed that racial equality would come about from, on the one hand, ending white prejudicial attitudes, and on the other hand, the acculturation or assimilation of racial minorities into white middle-class norms. But the theory of racial oppression led activists to emphasize a different solution. Instead of acculturation or assimilation, self-determination. Self-determination. Why this idea, why this concept from national liberation struggles? And we mentioned the Vietnam War earlier and it's impossible to overstate the impact that the Vietnam War had on an entire generation of Asian American activists. One of my longtime mentors, Bob Wing, says that from the late 1960s through 1975, the first question he'd asked himself after waking up in the morning was, what can I do to stop the war today? More than anything else, the Vietnam War taught young Asian American activists to think about race in global and geopolitical terms. And here's the testimony of Scott Shimabukuro during the Winter Soldier hearing, which was a 1971 event organized by Vietnam Veterans Against the War, in which over 100 Vietnam War veterans shared their experience. Quote, all of you have been here most of the day listening to how the Americans treat the Asian people, which are the South Vietnamese in this instance. I don't wanna go into the rhetoric of Vietnam essentially because it goes deeper than that. It goes into American society. You see, the military doesn't propagate necessarily the racism. The racism starts right back here in the United States and it is magnified when you enter the service. I want to relate this as a personal experience that I encountered when I was in the service. And Shima Bukuro continued, uh, during boot camp, I was used as an example of a goop. You go to a class and they say you'll be fighting with the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese, but then the person who is giving the class will see me and he'll say, he looks just like that, right there. Which goes to show that the service draws no lines, you know, in the racism. It's not just against the South Vietnamese or the North Vietnamese, it's against the Asian as a people all over the world, end quote. So what we find in Shima Bukuro's testimony is a sense that racial oppression starts in the US but goes beyond US borders and the racism that the military perpetuated against the Vietnamese bound in a way the lives of Asians in the US to Asians all over the world. And the concept of racial oppression and the internationalist perspective on race are crucial for understanding the dominant sensibility among those activists who called themselves Asian American in the late 1960s. And that sensibility was third worldism. And today when we hear the term third world, I mean, we usually hear it as a derogatory term, almost, almost an insult. But during the 1950s and 1960s, the term symbolized something else. It meant the political aspiration of the countries of Asia and Africa and Latin America to come together and control their own destinies. And third worldism in the US was the idea that Asian Americans, African Americans, Latinx, Native American communities all confronted analogous, though not identical, situations of racial oppression. And those communities were all engaged in parallel struggles for self-determination. From this perspective, those struggles could come together to transform a country founded on institutional racism, just like national liberation struggles could eradicate the vestiges of colonialism from around the globe. Third worldism was at the heart of Asian American identity when it first emerged. The term Asian American was coined in the spring of 1968 by Berkeley graduate student Yuji Ichioka when he and his partner Emma G founded the Asian American Political Alliance or APA. Now before APA there were student groups that brought together people of Asian descent, particularly East Asian descent, but APA was different. APA championed Asian American identity as an explicit rejection of the stereotypes associated with the label Oriental and as a provocation to political action under the banner of third worldism. 
One widely circulated organizational statement declared, quote, we Asian Americans realize that America was always and still is a white racist society. Asian Americans have been continuously exploited and oppressed by the racist majority and have survived only through hard work and resourcefulness, but their souls have not survived. We Asian Americans refuse to cooperate with the white racism in this society, which exploits us as well as other third world people and affirm the right of self-determination, end quote. So what distinguished APA was that it brought people together not on the basis of a supposed common cultural background. It was not really an ethnic group in that sense, but on the basis of the idea of a shared situation of racial oppression. When Asian American identity emerges, it's not about erasing ethnic particularities or cultural differences. It's about creating multi-ethnic solidarity against racism. And here's how one activist and instructor of Asian American studies, Pat Sumi, talked about what it meant to be Asian American um, in 1971. And by this time, by 1971, Sumi had worked in a child development program in Mississippi. She had lived in a commune in Palo Alto, California. She had done a brief stint as a college counselor. She had organized among US soldiers to oppose the war in Vietnam. And she even traveled to Vietnam and China as part of a, a anti-imperialist delegation to, to visit those countries. So here's um, Pat Sumi on the meaning of being Asian Americans. Being Asian American, quote, we are Filipinos, Koreans, Samoans, Chinese, Japanese, and so on. It means that the ways we are oppressed concretely are different. It means that most Filipinos are rural proletariats who are farm workers, while most Japanese are urban wor worker types, gardeners, seamstresses. While there are Chinese who live in ghettos, there are not many Japanese ghettos left. On the other hand, the largest slogans, the ones that try and move people forward quickly are the ones that do bind us together that we are all oppressed as Asian people, that racism toward Asian people looks a certain way at this point in history as opposed to the way it looks towards Blacks. Ultimately, you'll have to mention why it's similar to Black, Brown, Red, Vietnamese, South African, Palestinian, everybody else. That's what it means to be an Asian people for myself. Organizing on a mass level, it means being Japanese. On the revolutionary level, it means being third world. They're all one and the same. We are oppressed people, third world people, have always been oppressed people in this country, end quote. Let's take a closer look at San Francisco State. And some SF State students knew about the Berkeley Asian American Political Alliance, and they started an APA chapter at San Francisco based on the same principles. In addition to APA, at San Francisco State, there were two other important Asian American organizations. There was the Filipino American Collegiate Endeavor, PACE, and the uh, Intercollegiate Chinese for Social Action, or ICSA. And both of these groups um, are interesting because they are actually more concerned about dealing with community issues um, uh, rather than just student issues. Right. For instance, uh, this is Juanita Tamayo Lot. Uh, 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 Tamayo Lot's father was born in the Philippines and served in the U.S. military during World War II. After the war, he settled in San Francisco, where he worked as a janitor and then also in the uh, restaurant industry. And Juanita Tamayo Lot was born in 1948. She grew up in Japantown, which was then a, a multiracial neighborhood in San Francisco, and she attended a racially diverse Catholic elementary school. After high school, uh, Tamayo Lot first attended uh, the local community college, um, City College of San Francisco. Uh, and then while she was there, she set up a tutorial program for youth that was part of a larger program uh, staffed by volunteers from the Black Panther Party and the Brown Berets. And then when she transferred from City College to San Francisco State, her work on the tutorial program drew the attention of PACE. They recruited her to strengthen PACE's tutoring program in San Francisco's Filipino neighborhoods. Um, she and other members of PACE also did outreach to local high school students, bringing them applications to San Francisco State, which she would encourage um, those high school students to fill out on the spot. PACE also uh, served as a referral agency for social services, connecting 
residents to social service agencies in order to meet their basic needs. Now though, APA and PACE and ICSA were very community oriented, they also wanted reforms at San Francisco State and these two dimensions were connected. They wanted educational reform and ethnic studies specifically in order to make education relevant to the communities that they cared about. Here's what ICSA said about its support for ethnic studies. Quote, San Francisco State, a community college, exists in a moral vacuum, oblivious to the community it purports to serve. Realistically, we can expect that a Chinese woman living in the ghetto who speaks Cantonese cannot explain to the scholar that she is dying of tuberculosis because she speaks a street language, while the scholar, while the scholar mutters classical poetry in Mandarin. And this is referring to the fact that San Francisco State, they taught Mandarin, but not Cantonese, which is the predominant language spoken by the Chinese community in San Francisco. Um, the statement continues, there are no adequate courses in any department or school at SF State that even begin to deal specifically with the problems of the Chinese people in this exclusionary and racist environment. Now, apart from ethnic studies, the other crucial piece of educational reform that these organizations advocated for was open admissions. Open admissions for third world students specifically. And this is a demand in essence to admit third world applicants who do not meet the minimum uh, academic threshold for admissions into San Francisco State. And the context for this demand was that in the early 1960s, California had restructured its higher education system, increasing the academic standards for admission to the University of California system and the state college system. And once this restructuring happened, the number of third world students at the UC and state college systems, especially the number of black students, dropped dramatically. Open admissions was a way to push back against the growing stratification of the state's higher educational system. Asian American organizations focus on educational reform brought them into the Third World Liberation Front or the TWLF at San Francisco State, which was focused on making reforms um, at the college. The TWLF was made up of APA, PACE, ICSA, the Latin American Student or Organization, um, the Mexican American Student Confederation, and the Black Student Union, which had been campaigning for Black studies for several years. And what was the TWF all about? Well, they published a long statement of its organizational philosophy in the student newspaper. And let me just read a, a short expert, excerpt from it. Quote, the purpose of the TWLF is to initiate discussion and develop programs pertinent to the needs of third world students. The TWLF has as its purpose to aid in further developing politically, economically, and culturally the revolutionary third world consciousness of racist oppressed peoples both on and off campus. As third world students, as third world people, as so-called minorities, we are being exploited to the fullest extent in this racist white America, and we are therefore preparing ourselves and our people for a prolonged struggle for freedom from this yoke of oppression. Now, I only have time to give a, a very superficial account of the Third World Liberation Strike, a really extraordinarily brief account. Um, this is the strike that established the first College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State. Now, the immediate spark for that, uh, uh, for the student strike was San Francisco State's decision on October 31st, 1968 to suspend uh, an English instructor named um, George Murray. George Murray was a key figure in the movement for black studies. And the cause of his suspension was a speech that he gave on October 24th um, outside the State, Board of, uh, State College Board of Trustees meeting where he told the crowd, quote, we maintain that political power comes through the barrel of a gun. And if you want campus autonomy, if the students want to run the college, if the cracker administrators don't go for it, then you control it with the gun. And he concluded the speech by saying, quote, we are slaves and the only way to become free 
is to kill all the slave masters. Now that speech was on October 24th, Murray was suspended on the 31st, and the Black Student Union initiated a student strike on November the 6th, which was quickly joined by the rest of the, and endorsed by the rest of the TWLF. The student strikers issued 15 demands, um, which they declared non-negotiable. 10 were issued by the BSU and then five by the rest of the TWLF. And the demands focused on keeping George Murray at the college, establishing a black studies department uh, and a school of ethnic studies and open admissions for third world students. The strikers were met with violence on several occasions. One of the mo more notorious incidents happened on December 3rd, known as Bloody Tuesday. There were picket lines all around campus. Police officers broke up the picket line with physical force, um, chasing one student into the student cafeteria where they beat him in front of his classmates eating breakfast. Later, they sealed off campus and for about an hour, they swung their batons into a large group of students, faculty and community supporters, a group that had been attempting to march to the administration building in protest. Students threw rocks and bottles at the police officers. At the end of the day, S.I. Hayakawa, who is then president of San Francisco State College, declared at a press conference that it was, quote, the most exciting day of my life since my 10th birthday when I rode on a roller coaster for the first time, end quote. And students sometimes used violent tactics as well, though not as part of a coordinated strategy. San Francisco State, there were eight bombs planted throughout the strike and four of those bombs were detonated. There were also fire bombs thrown into the house of an assistant to the president. And one student was seriously injured by a bomb he had been carrying to campus. In the end, uh, Hayakawa managed to wear down morale and cohesion among the strikers. He used legal and administrative maneuvers to send strike leaders to jail for several months, to suspend and expel students, and he threatened striking faculty with termination. He barred all students arrested during the strike from being eligible for campus employment, suspended the funding of support services for low-income students, and asked the state attorney general to seize the financial assets of the student government. All of this began to take a toll. On March 20th, the TWLF reached a negotiated settlement with representatives of the college administration that ended the strike. Settlement did not meet all of the strikers' non-negotiable demands, but the administration did pledge to increase the number of third world students at San Francisco State, pledge to establish a college of ethnic studies that would house Black studies, Asian American studies, American Indian studies, and La Raza studies. And so with great sacrifice, and no little amount of suffering, the first College of Ethnic Studies was born. So now me, let, let me just uh, say a little bit about the way that Asian American studies was institutionalized and how student activists tried to realize their political visions in, concretely. The conventional story about this is that ethnic studies and Asian American studies comes out of really radical, really militant activism, but then once it gets institutionalized, it gets de-radicalized. And that's, I don't think, the whole story. And to illustrate this, we're gonna look at UC Berkeley where there is also a third world liberation front strike in early 1969, uh, and in UC Davis where Asian American studies was established at around the same time. So this is part of the Asian American Studies program staff listing at UC Berkeley from uh, 1971. And you'll see next to a lot of names are the letters FWA. Um, FWAs, that stands for Fieldwork Assistant, and these are quarter time appointments. So for every full time uh, position that uh, the, the program had, they could hire four of these fieldwork assistants. And these field workers were, in essence, community organizers. In many cases, they served as teaching assistants or discussion section leaders, uh, integrating community organizing into the Asian American Studies curriculum. Uh, and these field workers were joined by students on work study. You'll see um, the um, uh, W slash S stands for work study. And 
from this list, you can see that this um, the staff of Asian American Studies has uh, two people working, um, providing draft counseling um, uh, with the Asian Legal Services, that's the ALS. Um, there's five individuals running social programs at the Asian Community Center in San Francisco Chinatown, that's ACC. There's uh, two working with Jap the East Bay Japanese for Action, EBJA. There are eight people working in Oakland, um, developing a Chinatown community school and a high school counseling service. And in total, the Berkeley program had 28 people on staff doing community organizing almost full-time under the auspices of the program. And let me, I'm gonna talk a, a, a little bit more about um, the uh, Harvey Dong who's listed under the, uh, this section called co-op. Um, but let me just also point out that there's four people listed under Manila Town. And those four people are engaged in one of the most consequential uh, housing struggles in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the opposition to the evictions of elderly Filipino and Chinese residents at San Francisco's International Hotel. It's a decade long struggle. And the first uh, name on this list is Emil de Guzman. He would become one of the central organizers of the um, iHotel housing struggle. And um, here he is in 1978 attempting to stop the evictions uh, when they finally do occur. Now, Harvey Dong, who's on the right-hand side of this uh, uh, photo, uh, first enrolled in Berkeley in 1966, and he was one of 10 fieldwork assistants uh, assigned to the first course on Asian American communities. The course had lectures and discussion sections for three weeks, and then the rest of the semester was fieldwork. Harvey Dong brought the students he worked with to San Francisco Chinatown, where they studied the working conditions in garment factories, garment sweatshops, and talked with garment workers directly. And after the class, um, Dong worked with some of the students to actually establish a, a garment workers cooperative factory. Um, and he did all of this while employed by the Berkeley Asian American Studies program as a field work assistant. And now um, let me discuss one uh, little known, but actually one of my favorite examples of how Asian American Studies sought to embody its activist roots from University of California at Davis. And the Davis Asian American Studies program had only one full-time tenure track faculty member in the early 1970s that was sociologist George Kagiwata. And he was up for tenure in 1976. Now, at this point in his career, Kagiwata had published very few articles in traditional academic journals. But in an open letter to his colleagues in the Applied Behavioral Science Department, which is where he was hired, um, Kagiwata argued that he should receive tenure on the basis of his contributions to social change. As he put it in this letter, quote, although my formal training was that of a sociologist, I feel I have been able to overcome that handicap and now consider myself a community organizer and educator. The end products of my work are actual social processes which lead to social change. Asian American studies is evidence of such a process of change. And he then goes on to question whether any of his colleagues are even competent to evaluate him for tenure. Now, Given um, Kagiwata's attitude in this letter and the fact that he thinks of being a sociologist as a handicap, it's not a surprise that the social scientists in his department voted against his tenure. It's also probably not surprising that students and community members uh, rallied around him and his tenure case because he was the kind of key faculty member in Asian American studies in the UC Davis program. And for those organizers, they saw the very future of Asian American studies at stake in this tenure case. As they put it, quote, the university is attacking Asian American studies in general and George in particular by imposing traditional tenure requirements, research, university service, teaching, which would destroy Asian American studies in its faculty effectiveness. So none of that's surprising, but what is surprising is that this campaign was successful. George Kagiwara did get tenure. 
other faculty at UC Davis were so enthused by this victory that after it, they convened a meeting of a third world faculty senate to attempt to develop new alternative tenure criteria for third world faculty, criteria that would recognize community work and non-traditional intellectual work. Now, ultimately, the radical experiments in ethnic studies at Berkeley, San Francisco State, and UC Davis ended by the late 1970s in different ways and for different reasons. And the Asian American studies faculty retained a commitment to social justice and multiracial solidarity, but by the 1980s, Asian American studies more or less resembled other academic units in colleges and universities. Even so, some of the core demands of the student strikers at San Francisco State seem as fresh as ever. The demand for a relevant education that addresses students' lived experiences and the conditions of the communities that they care about, the demand for an educational system that is less stratified and more accessible. Those demands, I'm sure, will continue to animate future generations of students who will, in their own way, reinvent the meaning of Asian American studies, including here at Duke. Let's see what happens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chung Mao. Um, obviously, there are so many issues that we could address. And um, I welcome uh, everyone to type in their questions or raise their hands um, to ask any questions. Um, so while you're thinking or typing, uh, I may, if I would allow me, uh, I would like to ask, um, th there, so for me, um, the Duke Asian American Studies Program, which was founded in 2018, um, that definitely has like echoes of this history, student activism, but it is um, different. I mean, we are at a different time and we have seen other Asian American studies programs in the Midwest, Northeast um, look like more traditional academic programs, like you say. So, so what do you think is um, different about Duke's program here and now compared to the 70s? Uh, and um, what are some of the things that we, we should be doing to make sure that we keep this kind of history of activism and radicalism, um, that we don't um, just become a, just a, yet another academic unit? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So on what's different, there's two dimensions to that. The first I think is just the intellectual dimension um, which I find super exciting. So you, you could think of the San Francisco State strike and the Davis and Berkeley, UCLA as part of the first wave of Asian American studies programs, um, Calif mostly in California and, and uh, to some extent in New York City on the coasts. Um, a lot of how people thought about Asian American identity at that point was limited demographically in the ways that I tried to indicate kind of East Asian plus Filipino American. Um, in the 90s, there's a second wave, which, um, uh, which questions a lot of these uh, ideas. So you have Asian American studies programs happening much more in the Midwest and the East Coast. Um, a whole movement called East of California and Asian American studies emerges. And th that's also the same time that Asian American studies is trying to uh, have a much more inclusive sense of what Asian American identity means in terms of demographics. So um, because the impacts of the um, both the 1965 immigration reform and uh, new arrivals of, of refugee populations, particularly from Southeast Asia, there's an entirely new idea of what kinds of experiences need to be included in Asian American studies that there's a geographical expansion in terms of we need to tell histories of Asian Americans that aren't California centric. That really represents um, the second wave in the 90s. And we're probably part of, um, I would say a, a third wave in bringing Asian American studies to the South and Southeast, South, Southwest, South, Southeast of the United States, um, which um, is, is going to rethink the kinds of histories and the kinds of stories and the kinds of experiences that are included in Asian American studies. That's part of why I'm so excited to be here at Duke. Um, I'm, always, I'm fond of, people have probably heard me say this before, I'm fond of saying that I think the, 
politics of the United States are going to be determined by the politics of the U.S. South, and I think that Asian Americans are going to play an important role in that. And so I'm I'm really excited to see what happens here. Um, now, the other part of the question in terms of how do we um, negotiate the um, the let's say uh, pressures to be a traditional academic unit and commitments towards community work and and um, um, and uh, and activism. You know, there's a lot of really um, excellent models of things that have happened at um, uh, uh, what's it critical critical serv service learning study. I want to say um, that. Um, uh, Tania Mitchell at University of Minnesota has done a lot of work, I think, in um, uh, providing examples of ways that um, that we can really, I think, recapture the the political visions and spirits that first animated the um, the movement for ethnic studies. Um, and there's there's phenomenal examples of this, including at Stanford, where I got my PhD work with undergraduates around the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights and really involving them in the organizing um, for that really long struggle to, to win, uh, to win uh, labor rights for, for domestic workers. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, there's a question by Nicole Barnes and um, I'll, I'll read it. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I find quite inspiring Yuji Ichioka and other APA members assertion that white racism underlay the oppression of Asians in America as well as across Asia. At the same time, you pointed out that many people living under poverty in poverty in San Francisco Chinatown are oppressed by upper class Chinese business owners. I believe this was also the case in other Chinese communities across US. Is it possible that App APA lost an opportunity to construct a more broader based activism platform that combined class and race since they chose to focus on race more exclusively? Or was it the case that because they were UC Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, they identify even subconsciously with the uh, owning class and lacked uh, Jin Tamoya's understanding of class oppression? Another way of thinking of this, people in North Vietnam were not just fighting for rights as Asians, but also for rights as workers. How does global battle for workers' rights affect Asian American activism? Yeah, that's a great question, Nicole. Thank you so much for that um, really interesting question that gets to the heart of so many things that I care about and think about. Um, so um, I think it's a really important um, observation that you pulled out about the intra-ethnic intra class oppression. Um, the way that Asian American identity was conceived by many of these radical activists was a, a kind of class-based racial identity, very much identified with the working class, the the um, uh, the Filipino farm workers at um, Delano, um, who launched the strike, which eventually pulled in Cesar Chavez and Dolores Cuerta, that led to the founding of Farm uh, United Farm Workers, um, were a huge influence um, in, uh, in that. The I Hotel struggle was, of course, a working class struggle. There was this really um, strong identification with with um, with uh, uh, class based issues, um, but it the aspects of intra ethnic class oppression were not ex were not theorized very explicitly in terms that were um, that could be incorporated into the framework of racial oppression. Um, there were some attempts to do this. So uh, the the elites in Chinatown were often thought of as a kind of comprador colonial elite. So if you people would say Chinatown's a colony and and this elite in Chinatown is like the um, the local elites that the white society used to control the local Chinese community. So there were way, there were ways that they tried to theorize that, um, which which I think um, uh, proved not to be entirely um, fruitful uh, as class divisions in within Asian American communities uh, continued to grow um, through the end of the twentieth century. So. At that time, they articulated a combined class, class and race politics through the language of racial oppression is, is what I would say. Thank you. Okay, questions? Okay, then I'll ask my questions. <laughs> oh no, good, Miguel, please go ahead. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, a girl presentation, Professor. Um, my question is, is um, 
is related to, since I work uh, for one of the area centers here at Duke, uh, we're always trying also to uh, create uh, historical frameworks on, on how area studies came about. Then my question is more, more uh, related to that. Uh, you already gave us an incredible like, framework and, and, and history. Uh, that connects, you know, mobilizations, protests, uh, historical realities, terrorism, etc. Uh, my question is more related to to the uh, funding for for area studies, uh, Asian Asian American studies centers. Uh, as uh, you uh, well know, uh, there is uh, a geopolitical component, uh, an interest by the U.S. Uh, government. Uh, to um, invest uh, in uh, cultural uh, awareness, political awareness, economic interest uh, from universities in the US, training, uh, teaching languages, uh, and giving access to, to US students, uh, not only uh, people of, of Asian descent, but any student uh, that uh, is interested in this, then how, how that plays uh, within this um, uh, historical uh, 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 like point of origination and yeah. the conflicts that that uh, will, will, you know, uh, surface in, 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 in terms of research action. Yeah. So this is a really interesting question. Um, it's. It, I haven't looked, I haven't, I don't think I, I'll give a tentative answer because I haven't, I think, done the research to, to fully, um, to, to be fully confident. But um, at this time, you know, when Black Studies programs, and there's so many of them, emerge across the country, a bunch of them, the, 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 the big foundations, I think the Ford Foundation in particular, take a real interest in them and make funding available for Black Studies programs. And um, scholars like Nola Way Rooks and uh, Fabio Rojas have gone in and tried to analyze which, which programs got funded and which programs did not get funded. And it turns out that the programs that got funded were, um, were the ones that advocated a more integrationist politic as opposed to a, um, a politics of um, that saw self-determination through programs that were essentially for Black folks um, primarily, um, uh, and uh, programs that emphasized uh, academics as, op uh, as opposed to um, uh, community action. So within the Blacks, so within the development of Black Studies programs, um, uh, there's a uh, important cal calculations from the elites about what kinds of programs they want to happen play an enormous role in, in shaping the character of those programs. There's, to my understanding, much less interest in Asian American studies programs when they first emerge um, from some of these uh, large foundations and other funding agencies. And that is kind of what opens, I think, what kind of what opens up the space for these programs to kind of do more or less what they whatever they want um, with some important constraints set by the university. So I didn't talk about San Francisco State, but at San Francisco State, the the programs were managed by planning groups which were open to students and community members. So community activists could join the San Francisco State like Chinese American planning group and hire and fire personnel. Um, and, and design the curriculum um, and be involved in the governance of the academic program in a way that's, that's um, really uh, unusual, certainly not something that I see in, um, uh, in, the, um, in any of the programs that I've been around in academia today. So there's a certain way in which I think um, elite neglect of Asian American specifically, I mean, Asian studies is obviously a, a very, very different thing um, and has a, has, a, has a very, very different um, a profile, I think, among, among US elites. But Asian American studies programs kind of seem to sneak under the radar and, and have kind of a space of, a, of autonomy because of that. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, a question from Mark. Um, please say more about the centrality of the US South for the future of political change. <laughs> 
Hmm. Okay. So <laughs> putting me to the test here. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, look, the, um, the U.S. political system is, is one that gives, um, I think, the, the, um, okay, so there's a couple of, of dimensions to this. Um, one, I think, is that um, uh, the U.S. South is, on the one hand, the um, so important in progressive political change in the United States. If you look at the civil rights movement, of course, that's that's um, the the big example. Um, but throughout U.S. history, right, um, the the obviously the South was is important to the question of emancipation abolition, um, civil rights movement. Um, and um, and so much of, I think, our politics and polarization kind of comes out of the dynamics generated from that long trajectory of um, the Civil War, the first Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement, which many people call um, Second Reconstruction. And, um, and I think the, the basic question in US politics today is whether we're going to have a third Reconstruction that fulfills the democratic promises um, that were glimpsed during the first Reconstruction. So that's kind of how I, I guess how I think about it as a historian and then just as a as an activist. Um, um, you know, this is um, uh, this is the place where if you're a progressive, um, we need to we need to begin to make inroads if the entire politics of the country is is um, going to change just because of how the Senate works, how um, how how our representative democracy is set up. Um, I'm sorry, that's not a great answer. But I'll um, I will I'll have a better I'll have a better answer the, the next time I'm asked that question. Though, thanks for asking me that. That's that's great to be pressed on this. Um, but I think this is another kind of question um, that's a continuation of this line of thought from Matthew. Um, basically, uh, so I just kind of go to the question you mentioned. Um, the American South as key to the future of American politics, but I also think about Richard Quo's recent presentation on misinformation within Asian diaspora communities. I wonder how you see the role of newer forms of communication within Asian American communities as similarly instrumental and role they, what role they might play in future formations and shifts within these communities, especially in the South. And I'll also add to that this kind of more recent wave of immigrant, immigrants, Im immigration that are um, more, um, Kind of like the IT class, I want to say, um, they're they're not definitely kind of working class of the '70s. So I think it's mm -hmm. it's kind of tied to all of these kind of shifts you're seeing in this country, especially in the South. Um, you know, the research triangle area has one of the largest uh, population of Asian Asian immigrants or IT workers. So um, so it, that's related to the kind of question of Matthew's raising about communication and the class that they belong. These workers or these IT workers belong. Um, and the kind of lack of recognition of this history that you're talking about, of the need for Asian American studies that comes from this more working class um, um, kind of uh, advocacy. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's it's a kind of tied to the earlier question, but maybe you could talk a little bit more specifically about technology and communication. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I don't know if I have anything particularly insightful to say um, on this technology thing, since I'm hugely technophobic. <laughs> not good at any of these things. I mean, I think I probably have the same experience as a lot of Asian American folks who have relatives who are immigrants, which is you you see firsthand just how central so many of these apps are to communication throughout diasporic networks. Um, uh, and, um, and the dynamics there just are totally unlike anything that I grew up with. Um, so I, 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 so I don't, so I, and I'm a historian, so I can't, so it's really hard for me. To, I get nervous when I try to predict the future, right? But those are, those are new. I think that the pro, I would say the problem today, um, whether it's misinformation or, or, conservatism among different segments of the community. Um, you know, I'm 
I'm by background an organizer, it's an organizing problem, right? And so if you take the attitude as I do that, um, um, this, that, the, that the struggle against the most recent incarnation of far right politics, which is Trumpism, uh, is, is a generations long struggle. Um, it's one that will require us to, to talk to more people than we've ever talked to before in more places than we've ever talked to people before and in more depth than we've ever talked to people before. And that's the only, that's to me, um, regardless of the kind of technologies, that's the central task um, that, um, that we have. Thank you. Anna is asking a very important question. This is a question I'm asking my, myself and everyone, and I hope everyone who, who's here uh, and all of our students will continue to ask this question. Um, uh, so, so we'd like to hear more about how you see this third wave of Asian American studies planning out uh, or panning out. What types of shifts do you see currently underway and how, if at all, do you see these concerns mapping, mapping onto ongoing fight for ethnic studies? Um, yeah, thanks Anna for that question. <laughs> and I'm sure you could talk about this just as insightfully as we could. Um, um, so I think that, you know, the obvious thing is, the, is I would say the geographic, the geographic um, thing and um, that, so which I think we've got to tell more histories about what, it, what the history of Asian Americans in the South is conceptually. So conceptually what that means to me is, uh, you know, the, the kind of the mantra of Asian American studies in the West, California has been, oh, we need to get beyond the black white, race is not the black white binary. Um, so that was a formulation that really comes out of, I think the experience of the US West and how race looked in the US West. The, the South is not a place where you can come in and just say that um, because, U.S. Southern society, the history of U.S. Southern society is one that in many ways was structured by a, a white black binary. So what does it mean to do Asian American studies within that context? There's been a lot of attempts to answer that question. You know, Leslie Bow um, has written a really interesting book about that, um, um, making an argument about Asian American as uh, as one that uh, both uh, demonstrates the Asian American experience as both demonstrating the importance of that, the importance of that binary and also um, showing how it's constructed and um, uh, potentially destabilized and can be destabilized. Um, you know, um, I think that's something that we're just going to have to figure out as a, as a field. You know, I think the, um, the other thing that is happening now that is um, very, I think, different than before is the anti-identitarian turn, um, which has been in motion for 15 years in Asian American studies. So this is the idea that Asian American studies is, should not be linked to uh, identity as it's conventionally thought of, but modes, modes of analysis, frameworks, or the destabilization of all kinds of identities as such. Um, and, um, you know, it's not clear to me, it's, so I, I think the challenge is with that is um, how how we reconcile that with the kind of community based um, uh, spirit that um, that comes out of the first wave um, where where identity was was so central um, and how do we how do we think about this this kind of trajectory intellectually? Thank you. Yeah, we are definitely building a brand new program that's different from previ previous iterations. And this is a question that I think is gonna stay with us for a while. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ching Mao. Please join me in thanking him and for thank you for coming to this talk, everyone. Rohini, let me turn it back to you. Oh yeah, um, thank you, Professor Cheng Miao and Professor Lee. And thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. This was the last Wednesdays at the Center event for fall 2021. The series will resume next January. Thank you again, and we hope to see you next semester. Have a great day. Thank you.